Are platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram harming Americans in ways that government regulation could help correct? On Thursday, February 17th, Jonathan Haidt and Robbie Suave had an Oxford-style debate over the role of social media before a capacity crowd at the Sheen Center in downtown Manhattan. It was hosted by the Soho Forum, a monthly debate series sponsored by Reason. The Soho Forum director, Gene Epstein, served as moderator. Jonathan Haidt, professor of ethical leadership at New York University and co-founder of Heterodox Academy, defended the resolution the federal government should increase its efforts to reduce the harms caused by social media. Robbie Suave, who took the negative, is a senior editor at Reason and author of the recently published book, Tech Panic, Why We Shouldn't Fear Facebook and the Future. He argued that widespread criticisms of social media stem from our innate and misguided distrust of new technology. Suave also contended that for all of its flaws, social media confers huge net benefits and that the application of government force is likely to do more harm than good. Height, author of a recent article in The Atlantic on the harm to mental health from social media, pointed out that while the platforms were not initially designed for those under 18, they have arguably been its victims. Height likened the platforms to sugar, best taken in moderation. Here's Jonathan Height versus Robbie Suave at the Soho Forum. Jonathan, you have 15 minutes to defend the resolution. Come to the podium. Please take it away, Jonathan. Well, thank you so much, Gene. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm currently hiding away to, uh, to write a book called um, Life After Babel. And the, the, the subtitle of it actually could be the opposite of Robbie's. It, it could be why we should totally freak out about Facebook uh, and big tech. And because I'm hiding away to write this book, I'm saying no to just about everything. I'm really trying to find time to write. Uh, but I said yes to this invitation for two reasons. Um, the first is because I was being asked to be paired with Robbie, uh, who has been an amazing reporter um, since the universities began to blow up around 2015 and Greg Lukianoff and I got into this. Uh, Robbie has been doing just essential work and he's a great fighter, great, a great writer uh, and fighter, great fun to, fun to read. Um, uh, and I consider him an ally in our common mission to save universities from themselves. Uh, the second reason I said yes is because I thought about it and I said, you know what, um, I'm a million, uh, by which I mean a, a, a devotee of John Stuart Mill, who said, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. Uh, and he said, teachers and learners go to sleep at their posts when there is no enemy in the field. Meaning, we need critics, we need adversaries to keep us smart. And worthy adversaries are the best kind. Um, so I figured I can't lose because even if most of you vote against me, that just means that I really had a lot of work to do to understand this and write a better book. So thank you, Robbie. May we learn together. Um, I also want to thank, uh, thank Jean and Soho Forum uh, for providing this lovely venue and this setting in which it's actually fun to argue with people. Um, this illustrates an important point about the benefits of viewpoint diversity. We don't get smart just from being exposed to other ideas. If someone yells and screams at you on Twitter and calls you names and attacks your ideas, we tend not to get smarter, we tend to just get more wary or gun shy. Learning is highly social. Much depends on the institutions and the norms within which it occurs. And that's why I love universities. Um, uh, and it's because of what social media has done to universities and so many other institutions in the last uh, seven years or so that I hate social media. Now, um, in fact, I have come to believe uh, that a free and open society cannot continue much longer if social media continues to damage three things that I really care about. And those are young people, universities, and liberal democracy. Um, I, in my remaining time, I'm going to make the case that social media has caused devastation in these three areas since 2012. And then I'll say what I think government should and should not do. Um, so I'll make three main points. Uh, the first is the fragilization of Gen Z. So in August 2017, Gene Twenge wrote an article in The Atlantic with the provocative title, Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation? 
Um, and when I read it, I thought, wow, Jean is taking a risk here because she showed these graphs with these hockey stick curves, but it was just two or three years of data. Because in 2017, all we had was data up throughout 2015. And so we had two or three years showing upturns in all these things. And I thought, well, if that turns down, she's going to look foolish. But it didn't turn down. It kept going up and up and up. Now, when that article came out, there were a lot of critics. A lot of people said, oh, she's exaggerating. She's cherry picking. Oh, the trend isn't real. You know, Gen Z, they're just comfortable talking about it. That's why the numbers are, are going up a little, because it's, it's a good thing. They're willing to admit that they're depressed. Um, so there were a lot of skeptics right after the article came out, and Robbie in his chapter on this, on this uh, 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 area quotes a number of those skeptics, but those are all from 2017, at least most of the citations were from 2017. That was a legitimate take in 2017, but in the, in the years since then, the numbers have gone up so far uh, that the, the Surgeon General recently issued an advisory on, on teen mental health um, because those numbers have uh, gone up by 50 to 100 percent in many, uh, on many, many measures. Um, in fact, if you're still skeptical that there's a real epidemic of mental illness, if you think it's just, oh, you know, changes in self-report on surveys, let's look at behavior. <clears throat> I've been, Jean and I have been collecting all the studies we can find from the US and the UK and Canada. <clears throat> um, and so here are the numbers for self-harm. And this is hospital admissions. This is not self-report. Hospital records for teenagers brought in because they harmed themselves, mostly cutting themselves. If you graph it out, the lines are pretty stable. They don't move around very much up until about 2009, 2010. And then suddenly, in the next five years, the numbers are up 62% for older teen girls. The rate of hospital admission per 100,000 in the population is up 62%. For girls aged 10 to 14, these are little girls. These are prepubescent or just entering puberty girls. The rate is up 189% by 2015, nearly triples by 2015, and it's up more since then. Same thing in the UK, same thing in Canada, and similar story for suicide. There it's up for both boys and girls. And again, for the youngest kids, the 10 to 14s, the percentage increase is more than double. In a few years, the suicide rate has doubled, and then it stayed either level or increasing. Now, what caused it? That's the key thing. Uh, now, Robbie and the other skeptics point to studies. There are a lot of studies out there, and many of them find no relationship between the amount of time young people spend on their devices and their rates of depression. Um, now, there's a, one particularly influential study by Andrew uh, Shabilsky and Amy Orban, 2019. They reported an overall correlation of around 0.03 between time on devices and various measures of depression in three large data sets. And that study where they reported, oh, this is about as big as the correlation between mental illness and eating potatoes. That finding got a lot of press all over the world. And since then, a lot of experts say, oh, well, you know, we looked at this and, and there's nothing there. But here's the problem with those studies. They lump all kids together, that is boys and girls, they lump all screen activities together, including watching Netflix, texting with your friends, FaceTime, browsing the web, oh, and posting photos of yourself in a bikini for people to make comments about. You just lump them all together and you find a 0.03 correlation. But guess what? If you take the same data sets, and Gene Twenge and I did this, take the same data sets, use the same statistical techniques, but you zoom in on girls and social media, the correlation isn't 0.03, it's 0.2 which is a very large correlation in public health matters. The correlation between exposure to lead in childhood and adult IQ is 0.09. Public health is all about effects around 0.05 to 0 0.15, 0 0.2 at the most. This is a, as big as anything else we worry about. Um, uh, <clears throat> now, of course, correlation is not causation, Robbie points out, but we've collected, we found about 15 experiments, and the great majority of them also, using random assignment, find effects on mental health. Um, you want more evidence? Ask the girls. That's what Facebook did in that study that was leaked uh, last September. Um, and what do the girls say? They say it loud and clear. It's social media and especially Instagram. As one girl in the UK said, the reason why our generation is so messed up and has higher anxiety and depression than our parents is because we have to deal with social media. Everyone feels like they have to be perfect. Point number two, from curiosity to fear in universities. So a crucial part of my story is that social media was not toxic in its original formulation. You put up links to your friends, your favorite bands. In 2004, 2005, it was not toxic. 
Everything changed beginning in 2009 when Facebook adds the like button and Twitter copies it. Twitter adds the retweet button, Facebook copies it, the share button, and then other platforms copy them. And now you have so much engagement data that you can use algorithms to feed stuff to people based on what will engage them, which means emotions, which means especially anger. So everything changes between 2009 and 2012. We get a much more, this is when Facebook perfects that business model based on advertising and gluing people to the screen by having viral emotional content. That's when everything changes, 2009 to 2012. Uh, one of the engineers at Twitter who worked on the retweet button was quoted a couple years ago as saying, he regretted what he did because Twitter became a nastier place immediately. He said, when he watched those first Twitter mobs form, he said, we just gave a loaded gun to a four-year-old. And that's where we are. That's why call-out culture and, uh, and victimhood culture, but call-out culture in particular, emerges in the early 2010s. That's what Greg Lukianoff began to see um, on campus in 2014. When Gen Z arrives on campus around 2013, 2014, kids born 1996 or seven or later, Greg begins to see this weird pattern, this vindictiveness, this fragility, this attack mode. It wasn't there in 2012, but by 2014, 2015, it was intense and it was scary and it changed our behavior. Um, we've done a lot of research at Heterodox Academy on attitudes and what we find is that students are afraid to speak on campus because they're afraid of, not their professors, other students. And professors feel they're walking on eggshells, not because of other professors, because of students. And it's not most students. Most students are lovely. They want to learn. Uh, they want to be challenged. But there are enough around uh, that make it so that we all have to walk on eggshells. As Deb Mashik said, I'm sorry, is that five minutes left to, in my, okay, okay. Um, as Deb Mashik said, uh, uh, former uh, executive director of, he of Heterox Academy, one of her students said, my motto is silence is safer. What a sad motto for a college student. Uh, the third point, very briefly, is the Achilles heel of democracy. Plato said that democracy is the second worst form of government because rule by the demos, the masses or the mob, inevitably decays into tyranny. So the founding fathers of this country gave us all kinds of mechanisms to slow down mob dynamics. Well, needless to say, it didn't work very well after 2009. Uh, so I'll skip ahead and we can talk about this later. Um, but basically, democracy has a known Achilles heel a known spot, like on the Death Star, where you know if you hit that spot, it's gonna blow apart. And it is our, the ease with which we are divided into factions that hate each other so much, we don't care what happens to the country. Uh, social media, especially Twitter, but also Facebook and others, have really targeted that spot. Now, what can we do? The resolution here is not Congress shall regulate. I really enjoyed Robbie's book, I recommend it to you. He, he's such a clear writer, he goes through every possible issue that people talk about, and you find out there's a lot of misunderstanding of what's going on. He also points out just how terrible Congress is at regulating. And some of the ideas proposed you know, by, by Hawley and others, you know, they're specifying, micro-specifying, and you know, after 30 minutes, they should be kicked off. I mean, these are just stupid, stupid bills. Um, so if I was defending the motion, Congress shall regulate, I would just say, well, it's hopeless, and, and I'm gonna go jump in a lake. Um, but what, what we're talking about here is, do we have a national emergency? Do we have a gigantic problem facing our young people, our democracy, and our institutions? And if so, a lot of it is commons dilemmas, like prisoners dilemmas, things that are hard to resolve if you're one person. For example, many of you are parents, many of you have kids. Raise your hand if you want your, your children to be on Instagram. Raise your hand if you think that's a good thing for them. Okay? Raise your hand if your kids are on Instagram. Okay, not many parents here, maybe not among libertarians, but... <laughs> Okay, uh, Okay. I, I can't see with the lights in my eyes. Take it from me, all of us parents who, who let our kids on Instagram, it's only because they say, but everybody else is on it, I'll be excluded if I'm not on it. So we're caught in a trap and we need central leadership to break it. In particular, what kids most need is delay entry. The COPPA bill that set the age of internet adulthood, it was originally gonna be 16, was the original bill from Ed Markey. Lobbyists got it down to 13 and back in 1996. That's, at that age, you're like an adult. 
That was a terrible idea, and now we know. The age must be raised. I think it should be 16 or 18. These are minors, and we need to enforce it. There needs to be some kind of age verification. Um, so there are a number of urgent things that have to be done. The UK is making some progress. Perhaps they'll take the lead here, but I think we need to do it in this country too. Um, protecting democracy is much harder, um, I grant, because the things the left wants to do and the things the right wants to do are often um, opposites. Uh, so perhaps we'll talk about specifics later, but I do think we need to look into ways of, to encourage the platforms to do identity verification, um, uh, but especially, here's the main thing, changes to the architecture. I don't want a government agency either making decisions about what you can say, what you can't say. That would be a disaster. I, I have so many libertarian friends, I have been semi-brainwashed just by osmosis. Um, I don't want the government making decisions about what people say. Um, but there are changes to the architecture and the virality. That's where we can have big impacts that are content neutral, politically neutral, and language independent. They'd work all over the world. So in closing, Instagram and TikTok are raising our children. Our children are spending more time with them than they are talking to us, and those platforms channel the enormous force of peer pressure and peer norms onto them. Um, Facebook and Twitter are running our public square, and they are curating what passes for deliberation in our deliberative democracy. How's that going? Well, now, in 2011, we had the height of techno-democratic optimism. We thought these things would be a boon to democracy. But now we know they were Pandora's box, and we unwittingly unleashed demons. We can and we must find ways to tame them. Thank you. <clears throat> Robbie Swami, 15 minutes for the negative. All righty. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Gene, so much for organizing this debate. It is my great honor to have this conversation with Jonathan Haidt, one of my, my heroes, one of my uh, in intellectual inspirations. It's actually my great honor and sort of my great terror to be doing this. Uh, when we originally envisioned this debate, I won't say who, but I was going to be debating someone else that I felt a little bit more com uh, confident against. And then when, when Haidt got swapped in, I was like, you have to be kidding me. The world's foremost expert on the narrow topic we're going to be discussing. <laughs> great, thanks a lot, Gene. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, here I, I will make my, my best attempt. So I'm gonna be, begin by uh, reading to you um, three quotes uh, that I, I think well uh, capture the, the concern and the criticism of social media. So three quotes about social media. Um, this is from the Dutch sociologist Ernest Vandenhag, uh, say, and he says of social media, it's taken everywhere from seashore to mountaintop and everywhere it isolates the bearer from his surroundings, from each other, from reality, and from ourselves. Um, here's another quote from the Charlotte News. It's keeping children, their parents, up late at night, wearing down their vitality for lack of sleep, making laggards of them at school. And then finally, uh, from the New York Times, our, our very small children will fear to express themselves. Who will be willing even to express any but the most innocuous and colorless views? So as you may have guessed by the language of these quotes, these do not refer to social media. The first was in reference to the radio in 1963. The second was also reference to the radio, 1926. And then the final quote from the New York Times, that's actually from 1898, and it refers to the phonograph. Uh, later in that editorial, the New York Times writes, something ought to be done to Mr. Edison. And there's a growing conviction it ought to be done with a hemp rope. This was the level of hostility to new forms of communication that uh, have, have been so common throughout our history. Often moral panics fostered by the existing media structure because who loses out? Who loses your attention if your attention is now taken up by radio? Uh, by radio? Perhaps the New York Times. That same dynamic is underway today. So, so much of the most righteous indignation and condemnation of social media actually comes to us from the traditional media, the existing media, from cable news, from newspapers, from magazines, uh, from other, other things, other communications platforms that are losing that fight for your attention. They hate it, they're against it, they wanna come up with all sorts of reasons why this is bad for society, why, why the flaws we see in them are actually worse on social media. So I, I think that's always something to, to keep in mind when these arguments are being advanced. Often, 
by stakeholders, by the, the losing out technologies or the technologies that are harmed by these emergences that are not new, that we've dealt with over and over again. So I, I first became interested um, in this topic because I remember uh, the, the hand-wringing, the, the panic over uh, video games, violent video games. When they appeared, I was an active gamer as a teen, and we were, we were promised that there needed to be rules, laws, regulations to stop violent video games from getting into the hands of teenagers because we were told it would increase violence among young people. We now know that is totally wrong, that if anything, I, 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 I think I'm not saying anything wrong on uh, uh, social psychology grounds, but I suspect the small amount of teenagers inclined to really horrific violence actually tend to find an outlet amongst violent video games and it would discourage them from actually creating violence. Uh, so that, that was, but there was a certainty that, these, that this new technology was so harmful and so scary and so bad. So I, you know, I, I take that, all of that prior history we have of these platforms, all of these inventions as we explore this topic. So the, the contention for, for a while from, uh, from John and from Gene Twangy, whose you know, work I, I find very interesting and I encourage everyone to look at it, and I've looked at uh, these studies, which John has compiled a, a whole document looking at exactly what these studies showed, how many of them going through them, fielding criticism about them, responding to it. And I, you know, the, the, the broad claim is actually one that um, Twangy has, I think, retreated from somewhat, the broad claim initially being that screen addiction was the concern, that you know, kids just on their phones, on these new platforms all the time was Make, maybe making them not sleep well at night, uh, increasing their depression for various ways. Now we've kind of stripped some of those um, some of those concerns away because now we see that well, young boys aren't having nearly as much of the same negative experience. Perhaps the the ways they're using social media are not particularly unhealthy. Uh, video games again can have an actually. Uh, uh, a healthy uh, experience. They're cooperative, they're collaborative, they're storytelling, they do them with their friends, they stay connected with people. Uh, you know, just streaming, uh, just watching videos and reading articles is not necessarily harmful for, for young people. So we start to get at a very, very narrow problem, which I, I agree is a problem worth exploring and talking about how to solve, which is that one platform specifically, not screens in general, not social media in general, but one platform, Instagram, seems to be having a negative effect on not the majority of teenage girls, but some, some a specific demographic, some users were reporting that in survey data to Facebook. Again, it was not most of them, it was, uh, it was less than half, saying they were having a negative experience on the platform. Yes, can you, causal, can you correlate this with, um, with the increasing mental, uh, negative mental health outcomes, how young people are reporting? I, I, I see that correlation. I, it's certainly not ridiculous. But now, again, we're just talking about one platform, one group that had ha is having some problem with it, even, even the majority of people in this group not having a problem with it, perhaps using it to stay connected with their friends, staying, you know, uh, uh, having normal, healthy amounts of use. We, we, this is something we tend to see in the, in the data, in the surveys that, you know, teenagers who are using social media a moderate amount are doing fine. Those who are using it all the time are having bad outcomes. Those are, who are not using it at all also having bad outcomes because that tends to mean they don't have a lot of friends, they don't have people to interact with, and that can be uh, depressing and sad. But being a teenager is sad and is hard. It to kind of, no matter what, I, I bet if you surveyed all of those 10 to 14-year-old girls about, like, does school give you a positive experience? You get like a 90% no rate. Uh, my, my suspicion is a lot of unhealthy kind of culture of difficulty of being a teen might be channeled into this one specific platform that is not so great. Sure. Uh, the, the good news is we don't really need the government to solve this problem because Facebook, which owns Instagram, is rapidly declining in popularity. It is hemorrhaging users. Uh, so, so Facebook, the main platform, is dying of its own accord. It cannot attract young people to it. The kinds of uh, people who do use it tend to be to old, uh, which is no good for advertisers. Uh, it, it wants to be that new, cool, exciting thing that young people love and spend all their time on. It just isn't anymore. And this, I think, goes to the uh, maybe a, a larger sort of ideological argument I have that 
you're going to get the government in here to do something about it. By the time they do, like, this will be over. It'll be some new platform. I think there's already considerable evidence that, you know, even Instagram is not holding the youngest of the young people's attention anymore. There's been a vast migration to TikTok. TikTok is now, has surpassed Google, I believe. It's the number one, like, visited site. I, we, so we're still waiting, I, I think, I, correct me if I'm wrong, John, to, to get data specifically on how, how TikTok is influencing this age cohort. I suspect it will be more positively. Um, TikTok, unlike Instagram, is a bit more creative. And I mean, there's, I don't know how, how old the average person in the audience is. They're, TikTok's a little too, too young, even for me. Uh, but you, people like do dance videos, and they, they, you, you, you create things with music, and it, it, it's a little bit more uh, creative than the just like, a, you know, I don't know, attractive picture of yourself on Instagram that can make you feel bad about yourself if you're doing social comparison or that sort of thing. So I, 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 I think, we, you know, we might be passing the Instagram um, uh, moment uh, kind of uh, on our own without the government having to do anything about it. So, th so that's my uh, sort of grand argument against uh, th that specific area in which John is very knowledgeable and has introduced a lot of things that I think you know, people should be concerned about. And I also s totally agree that parents should feel empowered to not have their kids on social media, to take the phones away, not have them in, the, in, in schools, in, in, in the, in the bedroom at night. Um, you know, I was limited to one hours of video games on weeknights when I was a kid, and that was a perfectly fine rule because I would have just done it all the time, and yes, parents should make that. I'd love to hear from parents about how we can make that easier, but I, it doesn't seem like, it doesn't call out for a government solution. In, in fact, and th this would be my argument against some of the age restriction type things John is talking about, it seems to me that probably the best way to preserve interest in Instagram would to be make it like, sexy and dangerous and scary, like, you might die if you use it, the government won't let you have it. Uh, that could actually like drum up or increase interest in it. Why don't we just like let it kind of stop being cool on its own, as I suspect it will be, as all prior social media sites eventually do. I was using MySpace and AOL Instant Messenger when I was a kid. They are gone. You can't even visit them, I don't think. Um, so that's the, that's the harms to kids kind of category. And then, and then also, if, we, if we're empowering the government to do something about social media, which is the question here, we, we have to think about, so the government is going to stop the harms caused by social media. Well, right now, the government is doing that. The government is trying to stop the harms that the government thinks are caused by social media. And that is you posting on Facebook questions about the efficacy of mass mandates and whether COVID actually emerged from a lab. The federal government is actively trying to suppress those conversations by coordinating and communicating with the major tech platforms to have a vast crackdown and events, a vast silencing on speech. The tech CEOs are hauled before Congress every few weeks to answer ridiculous questions from Democrats and Republicans, questions that betray a complete lack of understanding of these technologies uh, that, and, and called to account for both taking down too much content, which is the Republican criticism, and not taking down enough content, which is the Democratic uh, criticism. Uh, the, the solutions, the proposed solutions, often produced by these discussions, uh, and I'm talking about things like breaking up the tech companies or uh, changing Section 230, which is the liability protection enjoyed by these sites, uh, are, are very bad solutions, I suspect. Uh, in fact, changing the liability protection is a solution so bad that Facebook has now come out in support of it as a way to prevent its nearest competitor, Twitter, from, from beating it. Uh, Facebook understands that if you raise the liability threshold for social media sites, well, Facebook, which uh, hires an army of content moderators will be in a better position than Twitter, which has many fewer content moderators. And uh, Twitter told me when I uh, interviewed people from this book, they said, yes, we are dead set against this. This will kill us. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's reflective of the kind of industry capture that, that can happen when powerful companies get involved with the government and, and do you know, practical uh, things that they say are in the best interest for everyone, for the consumers. These sites are so harmful. We need the government. Then it ends up being something that just helps one company um, o o over another. So I, I, I do not think <laughs> it's a good idea. And then we also have to worry about, even if we're just concentrated on the harm to kids part of it, maybe we'll get into you know, some of the other stuff uh, during Q&A or, or, or with each other. We do have to, like the First Amendment exists. I don't think the federal government should do things that violate the Constitution. We already know that attempting to ban uh, or restrict violent video games, the ability for, for kids to purchase violent video games, there was a law in California to stop that. The Supreme Court struck it down. Much of what we're talking about is pure speech, 
And I think the Supreme Court, honestly, frankly, would have something to say about efforts to prevent even young people from having access to speech. Speech is the most protected thing, the thing that is most protected by our, by our Bill of Rights, by our kind of uh, American system. I'm sure we'll get into some of the dysfunction, the horror that we're living in, the tribalization that we're living through, and, and it, it, is, uh, it can be ugly out there on social media. I know that just as well, if not better than everyone in the audience. Um, it, it can be bad. I, I don't know, and I'm, I'm skeptical, that social media is the cause of this dysfunction, of this anger, of this just like hor our horrifying politics. Um, I, I suspect it, it is a outlet, uh, but the, like, the, the anger and the wrath is mo mostly due to the actual like, behavior of our political parties and how they treat each other. Like, you see partisan sh screaming and lies and horror if you watch cable news. I, no matter which cable news you're, an, you're a fan of, you, you will see it on either side it, against the other team. Again, that's not social media, that's existing media. The, and the, the, the biases and the misinformation peddled by traditional news outlets and cable news are really bad. Are, are it, like it's funny when they're saying that. Well, Facebook is the reason Mark Zuckerberg, you know, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is the reason Donald Trump gets elected because of you know Facebook interference, that kind of stuff. I'm thinking, have you watched CNN or Fox News? These are 24-hour uh, commercials for or against. This is pro pure propaganda for or against one specific candidate. Uh, there, there's evidence that people are. Uh, you know, despite our concerns about the bubbling effect, the siloing effect, people actually are more likely to encounter information they might disagree with, more than we expected on social media. There's, again, it, it can be very bad. We, we, there's a lot like wrong in our society right now. I don't think social media is the cause of it. I think social media came along as these things were happening and there can be bad things we should Think about how to improve, how to improve our lives. Tune these things off if they're a problem for you. Keep them away from your kids. It is not a, is something for the government to do. There is no evidence. We should have no faith that the government can do anything. And uh, the government is a cause of much of this dysfunction in the first place. Thank you. Uh, five minutes of rebuttal. Five minutes of rebuttal, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, well, th thank you, Robbie. Um, there's very little in what you said that I, that I disagree with. I, I mean, again, your book is wonderful, and you go through the objections, and it's always complicated, and, and you've raised valid concerns about all the, uh, all the problems that I've raised and the solutions that have been proposed. Um, I, I do want to start, though, by talking about your description of this as a moral panic. You're absolutely right. This is a moral panic amazingly similar to the previous ones. You're absolutely right about that. Um, I really enjoyed your description of what happened when bicycles came out. Um, you know, there's a moral panic about that. But skeptics, skeptics of, the, of, of my position almost always point out the long history of moral panics, but that argument, to say that that's an argument against what I'm saying, that relies on what's called the survivorship bias. And that's where if you interview survivors of shipwrecks in ancient Greece and you find that almost all of them prayed to God, you would say, wow, you see, praying to God works. Because of course, you're not interviewing the ones who prayed to God and died, okay? So now Robbie's right that these communication technologies, almost all of them were objected to like this, but those are the survivors. Those are the ones that we still have, like the printing press, the radio, uh, phone, well, phonographs. But these, you know, these are technologies that, we, that survive, that we love. And in some cases, we had to tame. What else is there? Well, how about things like leaded pipes? Like leaded pipes, that was an amazing invention by the Romans, and it allowed, it, you know, allowed them to build cities. It was a great technology, and we used it all the way into the 20th century, even though some people kind of knew, even the Romans, that this is actually making people sick. Um, we didn't get lead out of pipes and paint and, and um, gasoline until really the 1960s, and it took federal legislation because there are all kinds of advantages to businesses for using it as a product. It, it increases the, uh, the power of gasoline. So uh, there are all kinds of technologies that we did object to. They were causing real harm, uh, and I put it to you, based on what I've seen, based on the studies that I'm surveying here, um, I think uh, social media is leaded gas and leaded pipes for today's children. Um, causing, I believe, permanent changes in their level of mental illness. 
Um, how about the Tommy gun? That was a pretty great innovation. It could shoot, I think, 600 rounds in a minute. A uh, really, real marvel of technology, and it was very useful to a lot of people. But it had some external costs that it imposed on society and empowered mobs, as it were. Uh, uh, it took federal regis legislation to say, no, we're not going to allow this technology for anyone. Um, and so I put it to you that you know, Twitter is the Tommy gun of, of today. Um, so that's the, a point there about the, about the previous social panics. Um, on, Robbie point talk, made it sound as though the issue here is just Instagram and that's going away. But I think that's not, that's not the case. It's true Instagram is uniquely bad for girls. Um, TikTok, I agree with you, it's not as harmful pound for pound, but it's also so much more powerful. There are deep pockets of TikTok. Girls are actually getting Tourette syndrome because they watch videos about Tourette syndrome and then they develop Tourette syndrome. So I'm expecting TikTok to have a lot, TikTok's funny and it's fun, but it also I think it's gonna do a lot of damage. The issue here is not a platform, it's a business model. The business model of advertising driven the, the user is not the customer, get them on and keep them on. I think we should protect kids from that. I'm very loath to tell adults what they should do, but I think there's now evidence that kids should be protected from platforms that use this particular business model. Um, then finally, I'll just make the point that Robbie was talking about data that almost all of this debate here in the scientific literature is using a dose response model, treating social media like sugar. Oh, well, you know, but if you have more social media or non social, like, you know, if you have, there's an optimum amount of sugar that you should eat, that's just like you take it in and it affects you. But social media is a rewiring of society for everyone, especially for all kids, between 2009 and 2012. Before then, kids went to each other's houses, they, they looked at each other, they spoke. After that, you go into any school now at recess or between classes, no one looks at each other because they're all on their phones all the time. I talk to cousins and nephews that are in college. They can't meet anyone. You can't talk to anyone because they're all on their phone. Everyone is, is hooked. So, um, so think about network effects, both for children and for democracy. And finally, Robbie said, um, um, you know, if you ask a 14-year-old you know, girl today, does school make you feel good? Um, well, Jean and I did a study on that. We found a data set, the PISA data set. And, um, it turns out loneliness in school was stable from 2002 to 2012. It was stable. And then all over the world, in all regions of the world, loneliness in school goes up after 2012. So it's a gigantic global network effect. It's hard for kids to talk to other kids because they're too busy performing on social media platforms. Thank you. I guess the only uh, thing I would add to that or, pu or push back on, yes, uh, it, it can be annoying to walk into a room and see everyone on their phone. People should put down their phones more, spend more human contact is good. I'm all in favor of it. This pandemic has reminded me how much I prefer it um, to social media. Although we should keep in mind that we are, I think, lucky that we did have social media as we went through this. Again, it is no substitute for actual human socialization. But because of massive external factors, we were told by our government that for people's health, you are not allowed to socialize. You are not allowed to do the most fundamental, healthy human thing imaginable. You must, you know, not like breathe on people. You have to <laughs> stay away from them. And I, I, I suspect that it's good or it was a positive that we at least had this to fall back on. I mean, if we're defining social media broadly, this includes the things that actually made our lives like literally possible during the pandemic, uh, uh, Zoom, Clubhouse, uh, uh, Netflix, streaming, etc. cetera. Um, also, when you do walk into a room, yes, everybody on their phone, it's annoying, but it's not like everyone who's on social media is not communicating. I mean, much of what they're doing is in fact socializing. It's socializing with other people. It's not people in the room with them currently, but it is other people. It can be people all over the world. I've met people because of social media, because of forums and various things that I, I would have never had the opportunity to engage with these people uh, if you, you know, I was confined to just the, my immediate vicinity. I mean, the, social media is a very uh, liberatory technology in, in terms of its ability to connect people across vast distances. I know that's like the starry-eyed uh, vision of social media, but still true to a, to a large extent. Um, finding a, Social media can be a way for teens to find uh, sympathetic ears, to find, to find healthy communities. Sometimes they find unhealthy communities. That can happen, but they can, they can find healthy ones uh, as well. So, so we, 
we, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not literally like everyone on a social media site is just like a lost zombie human who is no longer engaged uh, in the realities of life. And also there's, you know, we, we can talk about um, the, the, the mental health crisis, the worsening of it. I, I'm certain we will find an even worse mental health crisis among young people, you know, when we're counting the most recent years for, again, totally exogenous factors, the, the pandemic and the shutting down of everything that, like, kids hold dear, extracurricular activities, school, their hub of their social lives. Uh, so so I, I, I totally understand and, and, and agree that there's a huge mental health crisis and, and, and problems. I think some of it, uh, John addressed that in his earlier comments, you can't just say it's people uh, being more willing to be open about uh, mental health. I think that I, I, we might disagree on how much of that it explains. I'm a big fan of Jonathan Haidt and the coddling of the American mind where they predicted that when, when you make it so that in, in liberal activist circles, the person who is the most oppressed and traumatized has the most power, you will create a system where people compete to sound like they are oppressed. And the easiest way to like fake oppression, if you don't fall into like a category uh, where you might have experienced negativity, would be to say, well, I have a mental illness, I've recovered from PTSD, I'm traumatized for various reasons. And I, I, I do think that explains some, not all, not all at all, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, it explains some of the, we've almost like destigmatized mental health a little too far, where people want to see themselves as traumatized and, and victimized. And I, I don't think that's a healthy thing, but I don't think that's social media. I, I think that's the a kind of a cultural trend among, among young people, among young activists. Uh, the last thing I, I, I wanted to say before I return to my seat, it, it, it's still important to keep in mind, you know, let's as, as we talked about Instagram in those hearings, right, the Wall Street Journal report, Instagram so bad, again, newspaper, very anti-social media, uh, we're, we're likening Instagram, uh, Facebook to big tobacco. This is the big tobacco moment. You heard that over and over again. Big tobacco has killed millions of people. How many corpses can we lay at Facebook's door actually? I accept that it's more than zero. Is it millions? It's definitely not millions. So. And also, unlike cigarettes, which have no positive except, I mean, if it's positive, if you, <laughs> you like smoking them, but like kids, all sorts of vices have declined along the, the rise of social media. So, so like drunk driving rates among teenagers have fallen off. It's 54% decrease since the early 90s. Kids spend more time on their phone. They, they gather less. There are good, in, good in effects of that. There are, there are some, like, we, so we, we have to stack up, like, all the lives saved by kids not getting into messy uh, circumstances, uh, drug use, alcohol abuse, all down among the same age cohort along the same time frame that social media comes along. So it's not always good when kids are only looking at their phones, I agree, but it, it is good if it stops them from, like, killing themselves in a car. <laughs> Uh, thanks to you both. We now move to the uh, question and answer part of the evening. Uh, and uh, we do have a mic over there. And then for the people on the balcony, we have a mic uh, I'm pointing approximately in the direction where the mic is. And so we're going to alternate that way. Uh, the moderator, I have uh, the prerogative to ask questions. But uh, the rules are that either of you can uh, lay a question on the other at any time. Uh, do uh, you either want to lay, either of you want to do that or you want to wait for audience questions? Uh, 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 John, and, uh, please pick up the microphone. Jonathan, you wanted to put a question to your opponent. Please go ahead, yeah. My, my partner. Um, so uh, just one question. <clears throat> so we, we, have, we have this big change in teen mental health. It begins like in 2012, 2013. Uh, you know, something's a little earlier, a little later, but like, it's like right there, <clears throat> just as, as, as American teens move on to these platforms. If it's not that, what is it? The critics, the people I debate with, they never give an alternative. There's no plausible alternative I've heard for why suicide rates doubled a few years over the next few years. I don't know. I think the, uh, the 2010s are probably a, just a more depressing, horrible time than like the 1990s, no, I'm being totally serious. Um, kids are stressed out about, some of the things they're stressed out about I don't think are maybe as legitimate or to be worried about, but they're worried about climate change, they're worried about 
you know, the, the, the promise of going to college and, you know, you get taking out loans and then you pay them back because you get a good job. That Like, there's some instability in, in the kind of economic uh, situation for them that I, I think things were more chill and relaxed in the 90s. Um, like, I think that's kind of true. There, there's, it's hard to put your finger on what exactly it is, but, like, the last 10 years have been a worse time, I think. That, that crime is up. Uh, it, it is actually up. People used to be right, misinformed about crime, and now like, their perception that crime is raising is finally correct. Uh, which is not to discount that social media has had something to do with it. I, I, I can buy that a little bit, but I don't, I, it seems to be happening at the same time rather than a direct cause to me. Well, now, now here we're allowed to like, interrupt each other, right? What? <laughs> and, like, you know, and have like, a normal conversation. Yeah. So, well, um, okay. so yes, in the last few years, I think you could make the case that things are, are objectively worse on some measures. But put yourself back in 2012, 2013, 2014, we had the global financial crisis in 2008 or so. The bottom dropped out. Young people thought they had no future. Um, and over the following years, after about 2011, the economy gets better and better. Unemployment drops more and more. The stock market goes up and up. Everything's looking but up. So how, Does it get better this... for this age group, though? Does it get well, better it gets... for the but people what... staring this down? But why, would, but why would an improving economy affect, why, why would economic changes affect girls more than boys? Right. Why would, I mean, the timing just doesn't work for it to be economic factors. And in terms of it being scary things in the world, when big scary threats happen, you know what happens generally to the suicide rate? It drops. Durkheim found that in the 1890s. When you go to war, people don't say, oh my God, we're at war, I'm gonna kill myself. No, anything, any sort of collective crisis brings people together and that protects against suicide. Suicide happens when people feel disconnected, alone, alienated, not when there's a common threat. And if young women in particular, and we should be clear about this, you see the graphs, it's not just young women, it's young women on the left. Um, just in the last six months, two data sets have come out. All, ki all kids are getting more depressed, but the, it starts first for young women who say they're on the left, and it's steepest for them. Um, and so uh, I th would suggest to you that it's because they all got on social media, and it's the progressive girls who are all freaking each other out about, as you said, victimization, global warming, oppression, rape culture, all these things. Um, so even if it's the external world, mm. it's brought into them by social media every day while they're awake. But I, they could freak themselves out about that without social media? Not as much. As, I mean, when I was a kid, we would get angry about things the Republicans did, and there was like one or two every week. You know, and now it's like every hour. Well, but is, this is a much more politically vicious time. Th that is another major way in which this is just a worse time. Like, our politics yeah. are so oh, yeah. broken and so I horrible. Agree, yeah. uh, it, you know, choices that political actors have made, like, that didn't have to be made, um, that I mean, like, the inability to talk about anything other than Donald Trump for yeah. five straight years really is sucked. bad yeah. for everyone's <laughs> psyche, no matter w yes. if you love him or hate him, it's yeah. bad for your psyche. Uh, but I, but I, I mean, like, I'm not dissenting from the Instagram part of it. Um, okay. So. Okay. okay. Do you we, have a question we, for me? We, we might, do you want to put a question oh. to John? Oh, well, we'll let, I'll let the audience okay, go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, please uh, don't have to identify yourself. Uh, please just uh, ask your question as a question, and if it's directed to either of the two debaters, please state that as well. Go ahead, take it away, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, this is directed to Jonathan, and I, interested, uh, I was very interested in what you had to say. Uh, I think at the heart of what you said was that um, anxiety and depression among young girls had increased, had tripled, uh, and that the analysis you had done had showed that there was a 20% correlation with uh, involvement with social media. Yeah, now, a point two zero correlation. Yeah, that's twenty percent. Well, okay. Uh, mm, okay, okay I, I'm a statistician, so I do know that. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure that you understand that what you were saying was that four fifths of that tripling was due to, at uh, uh, at least due to something else, and that at best one fifth of that tripling was due to involvement in social media. If there was causation, and I'll get to that in a moment. So what you were saying was that one-fifth of the tripling, which would be a little more than one-third increase, so that depression and anxiety among young girls increased by about a third during the period, which is worrying. But really, I think, if that's all it is, it explodes your claim that this is some giant tripling of anxiety. At best, if there's causation, it's only increased by one-third because of 
uh, involved with social media. Now, okay, now, 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 let me just finish. Let me just finish. Because as you know, and as you've heard many times, correlation does not mean causation. It could be that all those other things which you haven't attempted to identify that cause four-fifths of the increase are getting these young girls to be anxious and depressed, and by pure correlation, they happen also to go on social media. Because they go on social media, it doesn't mean that they're going on social media as cause of anxiety and depression. It might be the other way around, or it might be a correlation with these other things. Well, I understand. Again, thank you, sir. again, your concept is exploded. I, I, I think, I think, I understand uh, sir, I think you made your argument, and uh, thank you very much. Okay. So be seated, and Jonathan, yeah. you have a right to respond. Okay. Yeah, so certainly, I certainly understand that correlation does not show causation, and that's why in our giant Google document, we have a section on the correlational studies, we have a section on the experimental studies. And the studies that use random assignment also find effects. So we're quite confident that it's not just reverse correlation or third factor, there is a causal effect. Um, secondly, oh, um, secondly sir, hold on, let me answer. Sir, hold on, sir, oh, no, sir, excuse me, excuse me. Sir, sir, sir. So uh, we, sir, there are a lot of people who want to speak, and I don't Unfortunately, have a, unfortunately yeah. the protocol is you just get one shot, um, and, <laughs> And, yeah. and uh, come yeah, to okay. the party afterwards and grab the guy yep. by Happy the... Happy to talk uh, to you afterwards. Uh, yeah. 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 Go and ahead, in terms of percent variance accounted for, this is what I was saying about dose response versus emergent effects. If all we had was dose response, I would agree with you that the, the variance we can explain by the correlations is not adequate to explain this gigantic catastrophe that's happened. I would agree with you on that. And that's why a lot of what I've been doing in my writing and what I did in my Atlantic article a couple of months ago was to say, stop looking just at dose response. This is a network transformation. This affects kids who don't use social media at all because before they could find other kids to play with and now they can't. You, that, you don't pick that up in the correlations of the kid who doesn't use social media because it's a network transformation. It's not just dose response. Uh, comment? Uh, yeah, actually, I, could you elaborate on that point a little bit? I think it's the part of your analysis I was actually least persuaded about. That, you know, what, you're saying it's right, it's not just affecting the kids who are heavy social media users, but because there's so much heavy social media use that there aren't enough dissenting kids to like find each other and it's so changing the, the environment. Like, is there enough? scientific evidence of that mm -hmm. yet, though? Is that really just like a yeah. theory for how this is impacting? Yeah. Well, so the other big piece that I haven't brought up here in terms of the, the depression uh, explosion is the vast overprotection that we put on kids in the 1990s. Right. Kids need to play. They need to right. play unsupervised so they learn how to work things out. Um, and we largely stopped them from doing that in the 1990s, or we, we, de we decreased the amount of free play. This, I believe, made kids more vulnerable, weaker, and then those same kids get on social media. And now I feel like I could do that great Woody Allen movement where he pulls out Marshall McLuhan. I happen to have Lenore Skenazy right here. Lenore, could you right. stand up, please? <laughs> so, Hello. Anyway, yeah. Hello, Lenore. Right. Um, so this is what I mean by a network transformation. Right. Um, before 2009, there's data from a British study I saw. In 2009, it was something like 60 or 70 percent of English girls said they sometimes went over to their friends' houses. Right. And in 2014, 2015, it was like 12 percent. Yeah. Well, that, that's, I fully agree that that's bad. I'm Lenore's editor, reason I <laughs> edit all her things. That, but that doesn't get to the, um, I mean, the government has criminalized doing this, right? <laughs> the government should do less oh, on this front. Agreed, agreed. Yes, the government should make okay. it legal to play at the park. No, 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 no. Okay, we get the government out of the Lenore. playground and onto social media. The next question. Uh, both focused on uh, the impact for children. I was wondering if you could focus a little bit on the impact for grown-ups. Naturally, we know about our attention span getting mushed up. But I was thinking if the definition of uh, social media was something to do with an app in which we posted content so that we could uh, share and, and connect, would dating apps be connected within this? And if the uh, algorithms are playing with the, date, with the dating apps, because naturally it's not their objective to get us paired up and live happily ever after, but instead to spend enormous amounts of time constantly looking, could the dating apps be considered a social media that could be actually generating a civilizational impact on how we procreate, develop, and have families and children? I guess that's a question for Jonathan as well. Okay. Yeah, I guess we'll do, yeah. I, I'll, um, so I, I, I agree with your premise. I think you're probably right. I just read an amazing book, a wonderful book by Cal Newport called Deep Work, and it really affected me in, in terms of the way that I try to work, and it really helped me stay off Twitter, things like that. So I suspect that, these, uh, that, that adults are also very affected, and I think the dating apps uh, uh, probably are affecting emerging sexuality uh, uh, among young men and women. Um, I simply haven't studied it yet, so I don't know. 
what I'm basically doing Do you think it's affecting them in a negative way? From, um, from, uh, I, I get, yes, overall. Um, but there, I'm not, but I'm not confident. I have not reviewed okay. the research and there isn't a lot of research. What I've been doing is looking where the light is best, which is on children. There are a lot of studies. We have a lot of data, large, large studies. I haven't seen any good studies other than like, you know, decreases in how much people are having mm -hmm. sex. There are things like that and stories. But I just, so I think you're probably right, but I don't know. Comment from you, Robbie, yeah. about that? Again, in so many of these things we're talking about, I, I agree that a subset, a minority of users can have negative experiences with these things. I, I mean, maybe this comes down to like a philosophical thing. I, like I am not going to have the government restrict access to these platforms on everyone's behalf because a small amount of users are having an issue, just like I wouldn't make gambling illegal because some people go to the casino and they'll bet everything they have. Um, most people can go and have a good experience. It's, that's just, maybe it's just like a libertarian philosophical thing. Dating apps, I would tend to think have tremendous Ups. I mean, I don't use them, but uh, they have like made it easier for people to find more prospective partners. Um, they've probably been very valuable to like the LGBT community and others who it would be hard to, especially if you live not in a big city, but it's hard to know like what your prospective dating pool is. There are a lot of advantages. So let's not, you know, as we focus on the harms in a couple categories, which I agree there are harms. Like again, let's not lose the tremendous upside of at at the you know, click of a button at your fingertips, having an entire world of people yeah. to engage with, date, have conversations with, and so on and so my, forth. My yeah. moderator's yeah. prerogative, yeah. I would not have met my abstract artist's downtown wife, but for a dating app. Uh, is there a, uh, Bal is there a question? Bal balcony, balcony. Excuse me? Balcony. Uh, the ba oh. I was about to say the balcony, thank you We're very much. We're up here, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and oh, you're up at the balcony? Yes. Uh, yes, indeed, and uh, that's, I was about to recognize you. So thank please you. ask your question, go ahead. Um, yes. So as we're discussing the decline in girls' mental health, I think it's important to note that we've devalued girls and their contributions. We've told them that their impulses toward Love and motherhood and relationships are wrong. We've told them that sex is an emotionless enterprise designed for pleasure and that they should indulge in porn and porn culture. Um, we've reinforced, reinforced gender stereotypes through gender identity um, ideology. And don't you think that the intense pornification of girls and sex has something to do with the loneliness and isolation and feeling like trash, not just social media? That's the question. Uh, uh, let me uh, ask you, Robbie, uh, just uh, as a change of pace, to be the first to answer that challenging question. Yeah, look, porn uh, does present um, specific challenges, certainly. Maybe this would be an area where I think at least the, um, the, the government may, may be doing some of the restrictions that you've mentioned for the other things. Certainly you could make a stronger or a case that would be less affected by the First Amendment because the Supreme Court has been more open to regulation on this front. I think the public pressure put on porn companies in the last two years was, uh, porn companies, uh, porn platforms, Pornhub, uh, was positive actually. Uh, I, 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 agree, I think them allowing, is it, Pornhub would, would allow unverified users to post pornographic videos without any Check, like it's allowing for a lot of um, uh, revenge porn, like posting without people's permission, which is actually, I think, the biggest problem in this category of issues. Uh, and and maybe an area where the liability protection actually, I would like add, I would be okay with being tweaked. But be, because of the pressure and the, the credit card companies saying this is, you know, we, you can't, we're not going to engage with these sites if they do this. They did, they changed it so you can no longer just like post at will without Pornhub having any idea who you are. The, the idea being then if you post without your permission, they can like give your information to the cops and something. Yeah. So I'd just like to add on to what Robbie said by pointing out that in his book, to your credit, that is one of the places where you very clearly say, here is a case where I think government regulation is actually necessary and good. So really, it's really just a difference of degree between us. And I want to also emphasize, when we're talking about, especially as the conversation moves to adults, I'm really reluctant to tell adults what they can and can't do. So like banning dating apps, like I would never consider, like no, I would not think of that. Um, but for children, it's very different. Children go through developmental periods, development appropriate periods, and so the concern there, especially, I think what, what I'm learning recently as I listen to girls especially, it's going through puberty while posting photos of yourself. That's the most vulnerable spot. That's where I think the most damage is done. So I think they're development appropriate periods. And finally, I think we both agree, and I would really want to emphasize this as, as an academic, 
my God, do we need research. If, if there are these big things happening, we certainly don't want to just go off and legislate because people think it's a problem, because that's how all the previous moral panics happened. We need this to be a research priority. The Surgeon General just issued this advisory, and the Surgeon General reached out to me, and, and uh, uh, Lenore is talking with him uh, next week. The Surgeon General is very interested in the possibility that free play is beneficial and social media early is not. But if we're going to legislate, I mean, that's part of the reason why we have the Surgeon General, not just to talk to the people, but to be a kind of a science advisor. All of this has to be based on research, and right now we have very little. Uh, I'm going to recognize the balcony a bit later as well. Uh, back to the orchestra. Ask your question, please. Thank you. Fascinating debate. Um, this is kind of going back to the first couple of questions, but isn't it really reductive and therefore incomplete to only be focusing on this one aspect rather than looking at the incredible complexity of young people's lives? And that does include their awareness of climate change, um, uh, uh, financial issues for sure, school shootings. I mean, this is the generation that grew up really genuinely fear, fearing, as unlikely as it actually is, that they, someone's going to come into their school and shoot them. So, I mean, I, I, I know we're kind of returning to the earlier points, but I just feel like, you know, this is not factoring in just how incredibly complex and difficult people's lives are now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we probably both agree with that. I would just say I don't think that's a social media, or that is not a, a thing you can specifically blame on social media. I mean, fear about mass shootings is one of the, is one of the mainstream media's, like, biggest, uh, biggest things it gets wrong, frankly, I, because, like, as you said, they are uh, blessedly extremely rare. School shootings are especially extremely rare. Um, yeah, kids are, there's all sorts of statistics you can look at, but like kids are safer at school than other environments generally. So the, the fear that kids have that they're going to die in school is, is to a large degree an un, uh, irrational fear compared to other ways they might harm themselves or come to harm. But it is such a, such a powerful fear that you could see how, how that could be one factor contributing, and I, I suspect it is one factor contributing, to the greater anxiety of young people for for reasons that the mainstream media has pushed on them, not social media. Yeah, and I, I would certainly be a fan of both complexifying uh, and simplifying. You want to go back and forth between perspectives. And in, in The Coddling of the American Mind, Greg and I tried to do that, to trace out multiple. There's like six threads that we trace out. I, I love stories about trends working together. I would just point out, people do not kill themselves because they're afraid. They kill themselves because they feel alone. And so school shootings is not, it might make people afraid. It's not going to make them kill themselves. You kill yourself when you feel disconnected, alone, shamed. Yeah, but yeah, it certainly yeah. factors into anxiety and depression if they are afraid. Um, anxiety, I suppose. I'm not sure about depression. Yeah. yeah. Um, next question, gentleman behind. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, my question is for, for Jonathan. Uh, so you were talking about earlier technologies and, and how they induced a moral panic before they were tamed. And then they got me thinking about the printing press and whether we'd ever tamed the printing press because pretty much anyone can print a pamphlet or publish a book. But then I thought of libel law, how you can't just print. Thought of what? Oh, libel, yes. Libel law and how you can't just print anything. And it struck me that the power of, of anti-defamation law as applies to written text, published text, is that it places the onus on the aggrieved party to raise that cause of action and to sue the author, the publisher, who printed the untrue and defamatory statement about them. Um, and so that way, rather than having a, a regulatory agency or Congress trying to design a one-fits-all solution, the regulations can, can sort of coalesce from the bottom up into, based on a response to, to actual circumstances. So my question for you is, could you imagine a, uh, the creation of a new cause of action, a private cause of action, perhaps at the federal level, so it fits with any resolution, that would provide the persons who have been harmed by specific intentional actions of the, the purveyors of social media, the social media companies, mm -hmm. that would then realign incentives in order to address the uh, the harms that social media causes. Well, I, I see what you're trying to do in sort of changing systemic pressures and changing systems so that you get a better outcome. Um, but the last thing I would want in our litigious culture is to say we're going to resolve this by individuals taking action against each other. 
What I would much rather we do, I think your example of the printing press is a very good one because it's an example of an incredibly powerful technology that brought down old and decrepit power structures and part of that is happening and part of that is beneficial. You referred to that about the vested interests are the ones who are most threatened. Um, but, I, uh, but I think it's a good example, as with so many of these technologies, that yeah, we did need a little bit of regulation. And I think there does have to be some regulation here. And especially, as I said, the, you know, the, the British example where what they're doing with their online harms bill is they're positing a duty of care that if you're a platform that is having minors on, you have a duty of care. They're not like you're, you know, it's okay, if, you know, if you want to just exploit your adults and for their data, you know, they're, they're adults where they make their own decisions. But with children, you have a duty of care. So I would rather that we have, uh, a, like, not the heavy-handed kind of regulation. If Philip Howard was here, many of you know Philip Howard and, and his, his books and his analysis of, of how terrible and stupid most regulation is, but where you, you lay out a general principle and you let the companies figure out how to meet it. You don't try to micromanage. So yes, I, I think that the printing press is instructive in many ways, but I would not want to see just mass action. I mean, we're already attacking each other all the time. To put penalties and fines on it, too, would just make it unbearable, I think. Comment from you, Robbie? No? No. OK, sorry. yeah. Uh, balcony question? Hi, thank you. Thank you both for a really engaging debate. Um, the big tobacco question seems very relevant, because we're framing social media as essentially an addictive substance that hijacks our biology. And so we need federal government to step in and save our brains and our bodies, essentially, especially those of our kids. Um, if I have a history right, though, and forgive me if this is really hopelessly libertarian, um, the federal government response to big tobacco only came after there was a really strong social science consensus that tobacco was harmful. And it seems that we're still cobbling together some sort of consensus, exact consensus about social media. Right. So I guess my question is, is there reason to believe that once a really strong consensus emerges, that there won't be more of a grassroots response from parents and even from kids themselves um, about how they're going to change how they relate to social media, which will then change how platforms appeal to them? Um, and is there reason to believe that won't happen or that the federal government could do this more efficiently than parents or the kids themselves? You're right that there's no consensus. In fact, if you took all the people who say that they're social media researchers, I would say the majority of them are skeptical that social media is a cause. And Gene Twenge and I are the main people who are in a debate. There are a few others who are on our side, but we are actually right now the minority position. I believe that's because they're all focused just on the dose response data, that's all. And there's so much more going on. Now, if there was, and so if there was to be a consensus, would this suddenly galvanize the nation, like, no, I don't think galvanization and data tend to go together very well. Um, or I wish they did, but they don't. Um, so that's why I'm hoping, you know, let's take small steps based on, uh, oh, and one of the main things that Lenore and I are talking with the Surgeon General about is, here are the experiments that would, that would not settle it, but here are the experiments that would tell us because what we need to do is school by school. Don't just like tell one kid to use more or less. Have an entire school district have a, a phone locker policy and have the next school district not have it. And we'll know in two years whether it was beneficial. So, um, so I'm very reluctant, again, to tell adults what to do. But yeah, when it's kids, we really need to do research on, what, on what's harming them. And if it's not harming them, then I, I wouldn't want bans. And, I, and just to add, I, I really do expect it'll be something new. The ki like, there is... I have very little faith that kids will continue to be interested in the social media sites that are popular right now. There's such turnover in this space. The, the ones that have, have been around now for a while are you know, declining in popularity. I mean, I, I, this is even true for me. I, and I'm a, I'm a very active, I was a very active social media user. I realized the other day that I use Twitter a lot less all of a sudden. Um, I, I'm using Instagram less. I don't use Facebook at all. I'm not going to get into TikTok. <laughs> so it, it, some, some of these things will have a natural lifespan, and the, the next thing that comes along could be healthier, even for kids, for the population we're talking about, than Instagram is. This could be a, a one-off. Because, again, the, the problem, even based on what you're saying, is not really social media. It's this platform for these people, for which I agree. Model. Yeah. Which I agree. But I would never make government policy at that. I mean, it's very hard. To, and then even among that population, you'd have still the majority of girls in that age group using Instagram responsibly and not having a negative. You, you, you know, you have, I think it was like two out of five, right, in, that, in the Facebook internal data or something. Yeah, but again, that's do the dose response thing. Yeah, it's, well. Yeah. They'd all be better off if they didn't have it, is my argument. I don't, yeah, I don't think so. Um, another question from Ralph Balcony. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is to jo Jonathan. On Instagram specifically, at the same time that there are young girls incentivizing a certain type of body or a lifestyle, 
there are uh, that make girls uh, feel bad about themselves or trying to fit into a world that they will never fit. At the same time, however, we have many profile accounts telling them, accept yourself, it is okay to be whatever you want to be. So you don't think in this regard, social media can auto-regulate themselves and uh, you don't think it must be a choice for the users to follow what makes they feel better. Or in the case of minors, you don't think the parents should be the responsible for helping them. Like, parents cannot uh, see what the kids are doing all the time. So the government will never be able to do this. So that's my question. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, if we just look at content, if we thought that, you know, all that matters here is content, just like what the kids see, and then we can say, well, you know, maybe if we can get, maybe there's a lot of good content, and maybe if the good content is 10 times the amount of bad content, maybe that would be okay. But my argument as a social psychologist is that it's not primarily about the content. It's about going through middle school, which is already the worst time of life for most people. It's always been worse for girls going through middle school where most of your consciousness, even when you're in class, most of your consciousness is about the drama going on and it's about the photo that you posted and it's, it, kids are learning to be brand managers and performers when they should be out playing. And so I don't focus very much on the content and that's why I'm not very interested in content moderation. It's a whack-a-mole game, it's a hopeless errand. I'm focused on the dynamics, especially the social dynamics. And I think these platforms are unsafe at any speed for young kids, especially around 12, 13, 14. Anything photo-based, and the girls go for the photo-based platforms. The boys went for video games and also for YouTube um, back in the early 2010s. Um, the second part of your question was, um, oh shoot, what was it? Oh, I want to repeat that. Uh, choosing uh, what Oh, the parents, yes, can't, can't the parents do it? Um, so, you know, if it's, if it's like how much candy you eat, well, a parent can control how much candy you eat in your own house, but it's hard to control outside, of course. Instagram and, and these platforms are a little different because um, it's like, um, you know, imagine that a candy company contracted with your daughter to hook up a, a pipeline of candy into her bedroom, and no permission is needed from your parent. Your parents don't even know. They just do it, and they do it all over the world. And you can't stop it because yeah, if you're really vigilant, you could, you could catch it at the window, but then you, as long as she can get to a web browser, she'll get it. So these companies are going around our backs, they're putting us in a trap. None of us, well, very few of us want our kids to be on, but they're in a, it's, a, it's a classic economic social dilemma where we each give in because we don't want our kids to be isolated. So I think this really calls out for some central force to break the trap, especially when we're talking about underage kids. I've, I've had two conversations with Mark Zuckerberg, two conversations with Adam Mosseri. I bring this up every time, and they always say, oh, but we don't allow kids under 13. Well, after my, second, after my first conversation with Mark Zuckerberg, before the second, I just created a fake account for my daughter, and I lied about her age. I said, oh, yeah, Mark, really? I just made an account for her. So, you know, it's a trap. It's illegal. With, well, I don't think it's illegal. Especially for under 13, there's no excuse for this, I think. Um, I'm afraid uh, we're running out of time, uh, and uh, Robbie, uh, brief, make a brief comment if you want. Yeah, it, it, just, it will be very hard, no matter how uh, interested the government is doing this, from stopping, from like, th this is a genie that cannot be put back into the bottle, of, like, kids will find ways to access these sites. We should ac absolutely empower you know, parents, local decision makers, you know, school counselors should talk to people about Respond, especially talk to the vulnerable group, the, the young women. I, I think they should talk to young men as well about uh, porn addiction. Again, we're not totally clear on what the research tells us. These are absolutely conversations that they should be having in the school, but at the level of banning and prohibiting, they're going to get around it. And we, we, could, we could make these, these platforms seem more seductive and more tempting because now they're part of the forbidden. Uh, thank you for excellent questions. We're running out of time in the Q&A. Uh, we're going to move to the summary portion of the evening. Jonathan Haidt, uh, speaking for the uh, affirmative, please take the uh, podium. Okay, well, well thank you, Jean. Thank you, uh, Robbie. Thank you to the audience. Um, uh, I'm extremely interested in the power and importance of viewpoint diversity, and especially as we saw tonight, uh, you have two people. We agree on a lot, we disagree on a lot. Um, and this was fun. And we both come out with more refined, more nuanced uh, views of a very complicated and very, very important topic. Um, in my closing remarks, I just want to, um, let's see, I want to make a couple of points. Um, let's see. Okay, I'll. I'll so suppose, um, 
here's a thought experiment I've been playing with. I want to, I'll try to work it out here. Um, suppose we're back in 1993, uh, before most people had really seen, seen the internet. And imagine that a genie appeared and he, he put in front of us three magical boxes just floating in the air in front of you. And, and he said, you can open none, one, two, you can open as many as you want or none of them. And on the first one, um, the label said internet. The second one, it said iPhone. And the third, it said social media. Um, now, knowing what we know now, which ones do you think we should have opened or which ones would you choose to open or which ones do you think were good for society to open? So let's do, let's, let's do a little poll. So suppose so the internet. Um, uh, so you know, obviously enormous benefits. And yeah, there are some downsides. I mean, lots of things can happen on the internet that are bad. Um, raise your hand if you think we'd be better off if we didn't have the internet. Raise your hand high. Okay, one. And now raise your hand if you think, no, it's a really good thing that we have the internet. Raise your hand. Okay, it's like an insane question, especially in a room full of libertarians. Um, so the internet, I mean, the cost-benefit ratio, the transformative effects of the internet, the things it made possible, the things it brought uh, outside of, of wealthy countries and made available to people all over the world, uh, it, it's transformative in a good way like electricity or like fire. Uh, so the internet, boy, are we glad we opened that one. And remember, for some of you, if you're old enough like me, it's like, you know, the first time you see it and a web browser, like, it was, it was inconceivable. It was like all the information, like, there for free? Amazing. All right, next one, the iPhone. Now, smartphones, it's a little more complicated because there are claims that smartphones have damaged a generation, smartphones are addictive, things like that. But this is the most amazing Swiss Army knife ever created. And I sleep with mine under my pillow because it's useful as a flashlight and useful as a clock, and I go everywhere with it. Um, and you know, as, as Steve Jobs originally intended, it was gonna be like a Swiss Army knife with these like five or six things that are tools that you can use. Now, in some ways, now it uses us, but we'll get to that. As a Swiss Army knife, I think this is an incredible thing. Now, do you think that the, the world would be better off if we never had smartphones, if we all were just on flip phones? Raise your hand if we, you think we should not open that box. Okay, so now we get about, about 10 people saying, yeah, we'd be better off if we didn't have smartphones, just flip phones. Raise your hand if you think, no, it's a good thing we have smartphones. Raise your hand. Okay, so about 90%, all right? Okay, now we come to the third box. And remember, each box you open is gonna take 10 to 20 hours a week from you, okay? Now, what do you get for the internet? You get a lot, you learn a lot. What do you get from, from your iPhone? It solves a lot of problems, finding you taxis, all sorts of things. So each, each time you open a box, it's an extra 10 to 20 hours, okay? So now we're up to 20 to 30 hours a week from internet and smartphones, okay? Now there's a third box. It says social media, or it says Facebook, or Instagram, let's just say social media. Um, now, if you open it, what do you get? You get constant updates about what someone had for lunch and why someone hates somebody and why somebody is a fascist or a racist. Um, um, and, and what are the downsides? Well, I've been making a case that there are many, many downsides. So what I'd like you to do is imagine, imagine a world without, without social media. Imagine, uh, imagine a world in which the only way you could communicate with other people was by phone, email, texting, WhatsApp, Skype, Zoom, FaceTime, blogging, Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft, a thousand other video games, multiplayer games, the US mail, and walking over to someone's house, ringing the doorbell, and using your vocal cords. Imagine such a world. Robbie said we should be grateful that we had social media during the pandemic. No, we should be grateful that we had these 50 other platforms that could connect us. Our kids would have been so much better off if they had to actually Zoom each other rather than posting, 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 commenting. Oh, you look great, love it. Like, no, that was stupid. That was, a way, that was not connecting, that was performing. We would have been so much better off if we did not have social media of that business model if we just had everything else. Uh, that at least is my claim. Um, so, um, uh, so if, in conclusion, um, if you're happy that we opened that third box and you think everything's going fine and you think we shouldn't exert some, some kind of, of, of uh, centralized effort to try to clean things up, uh, research-based, of course, but if you're happy with the way things are going, you should vote after, after these statements. You should vote no on the resolution. But um, if you join me in imagining a better world, healthier kids, and a more admirable democracy, I urge you to vote yes. Thank you. Someone said once, 
Maybe they didn't. Maybe I said it. All debates eventually become debates over definition. So I would like to go over those lists of things you just mentioned that were good. I mean, like, is that doesn't count as social media? Again, if we confine social media to just the experience teenage girls have on Instagram, yes, it's not great, right? Uh, but so many people are using things we, we just would describe as social media. I would describe AOL Instant Messenger and MySpace, the things I used when I was a teenager, to great enjoyment, to have much better uh, friend, much larger friend groups to make friends. I was a shy kid. I didn't make a lot of friends in school. I, I made them after school on in, in what is clearly described as social media, I think. I, I bet that's the experience. I, anecdotally, I hear this from young people. That is the experience still of a lot of kids that, that school, school the, peop, the class they're sorted into, that they would have been lucky to be sorted into in normal times, but have not been sorted into because they've not actually even been in school for two years, is not as enjoyable as the networks they can curate and create for themselves because of this amazing te technology that I would not, that I would absolutely open that box and unleash on the world because you don't have to use it. The choice is still yours. You can unplug. Some people can unplug. We hear, I think, a lot from the loudest, angriest, and most addicted people, which warps this conversation. The Social Dilemma movie, which you were, were you the only person, in my view, giving like sane, saying normal, sane things in that Netflix documentary, which is mostly about all these former tech people bragging about how they think they've hacked your brain and that your decisions are no longer your own and they control you and isn't it bad but also kind of cool what they were able to do. Like they're bragging that they did this. I, I'm listening to these people and like, you know, you're tech addicts. Like you, 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 you people who worked for these companies and were involved, I, I get that you're a little bit too addicted and too in love and obsessed in an unhealthy way with this product. Is this most people's experience? I don't think it is. Uh, we didn't talk about this as much. Jonathan sort of started to suggest that it, the quasi-nefarious thing these, these, these platforms are doing in, in that they co they're collecting data about you and then sell or selling a curated your, uh, user experience and providing you with advertisements. I'm, so I'm pro-capitalism, so I don't think this is necessarily as malicious as it's made out to be. Yeah, I can watch television all day and be bombarded by advertisements for products that are irrelevant to my interests that I have no interest in buying. But when I visit social media, I am shown things that might actually improve my life, that I might want to buy. I'm not forced to buy them. The kind of, like, it's hypnotism is, I, I, like, I don't believe that. Maybe there are social psychologists, again, bragging about their own achievements, trying to say that this is something they've created. I don't believe it. Uh, I, I think it's it's it largely can be can be uh, a benefit. So we, we've concentrated a lot in these remarks because Jonathan is such an expert on it and, and it's an important topic, you know, the harms to kids element of it. But I, you know, I just want to remind you that that's probably like 25% of the conversation right now about why the government needs to do something about social media. Most of the energy attention to this issue is focused either on um, uh, the, the limiting the spread of misinformation, that's the major liberal concern. And then on right, something we didn't even touch here tonight is the concern that, that, these, uh, that the platforms are, are censoring too much information. Um, so we, those are, the, and, and my, my book, if you're interested in it, <laughs> gets into those a lot, a lot more because they really are the things we're talking about. So I, you know, I just wanted to say 30 seconds again uh, on, on those be before we wrap that I think uh, the, the whatever legitimate beefs there are uh, do not lend themselves whatsoever to a government solution, which is the, the, the question on the table. And in fact, the interest that the government has in regulating social media along these lines and not, this, not the stuff where there maybe is some cause for concern uh, is, is, is illustrative and should give us pause about pursuing any, inviting in any capacity the government uh, to do more about this. And, and on the misinformation question specifically, because really this is the, the I would, I, I don't, I'm not sure what, what your take would be. I think this is the major reason people want to regulate social media these days, or at least the one I come into contact with the most. Here, the research is, a, is, is very favorable. I, I think to my position, uh, a lot of the, the panic about how much people being inundated with so many lies and et cetera, et cetera, is, has not been borne out uh, by the data. Actually, it's, it's like a tiny number of social media users who are sharing the most 
uh, like uh, alarming social media misinformation. It's a tiny number of users who are seeing it. It pales in comparison to the misinformation they're inundated with in the, on the media platforms that existed before it. Uh, but th this is the animating concern of the Biden administration and the FTC and the FCC, of the government figures who actually will do the regulating, who are going to do something about social media. This is what they care about, and it will have very bad consequences for free speech. Thank you. Uh, Connor, please open the voting. Please take out your smartphones and uh, please uh, vote yes, no, or undecided. You could still be undecided on the resolution uh, if you were undecided uh, before or if you voted yes or no. Again, the federal government should increase its efforts to reduce the harms caused by social media. Uh, yes, no, or undecided on the resolution. Drum roll, please. Uh. Okay. Uh, now, um, the resolution. Um, uh, the, uh, the resolution uh, got initially 28% of the vote. It rose to 37.7%. It picked up 9.8 percentage points. 9.8 percentage points is what you picked up. Jonathan, and that's the number to beat. The no votes also picked up, but picked up 1.8 percentage votes. Therefore, the Tootsie Roll goes to Jonathan Haidt. Congratulations, John. Congratulations to you both.